In the last session, we looked at the relationship between holism and servanthood. And in this session, I'd like to look at that last section that we, our section of what we want to look at and develop that a little further to see what's the relationship between holistic servanthood and transformation. Well, I'd like to present two examples to you. First one is from the very early church. At the time of Jesus, as you'll see from this slide, uh, in Acts 15, there were about 120 Christians that we know of for sure. And at that time, there were about 60 million people in the Roman Empire, the entire Roman Empire. And that's about two millionths of 1%, not very big. And not only were they not very popular, they were very tiny. And, you're, and the question is, how in the world could have such a tiny group of people made such an impact so that by 300 years after Jesus, that Constantine reclassified a pagan empire into a Christian empire. Talk about transformation, wasn't all good, but man, Rodney Stark, who's one of the most well-known um, sociologists of our day, historian, was um, thinking about that question and he wanted to find out what was it about this tiny group of people who, was, who were able to somehow bring about such a radical, what he feels is the most radical transformation in all of early Western history. Well, he does some statistics and he says by about 40 AD, there may be a thousand Christians, still 200 thousandths of 1%. But by 300 AD, he estimates there were about 10.5% of the population of 6 million people were Christians. Well, you look at our culture here in North America, and wow, there are a lot more than 10.5% who claim to be Christians. You look at some of the African countries that are the most corrupt, and they're more than 50% of the people claiming to be Christians. Well, what was it about these early Christians that allowed them at 10.5% to have such an impact that the emperor reclassified a pagan empire into a Christian empire? Well, Rodney Stark identifies the beliefs that these people had, and you'll see them on this next slide. One belief that they had which was contrary to most of the pagan beliefs, was that these people called Christians, they had a God who loved those who loved him. That wasn't true of most of the Roman gods. The Roman gods were very capricious. They could care less whether their people loved them or not. All they wanted to do was worship them. Another one was that the Christians had a merciful God who requires mercy. Again, very contrary to the Roman idea of what it meant to be a Roman citizen. Rome was known for its cruelty. Its government, its games, its politics were cruel. They were power-based. But in this new religion, the Christians were to be merciful. Why? Because their God was merciful. Mercy in that time and that culture was seen as a weakness. God saw it as a strength and he required that same strength for his own people. Thirdly, it was a culture that was stripped of ethnicity and class. A slave would come into a local church that was meeting in fellowship and come up to a nobleman and say, good morning, brother. What? You're a slave, how dare you call me a brother? Not in the church. The high class and the low class 
were looked at as equal. Why? Because God looked at everyone as an equal. Men were to love their wives as they loved themselves. There was a rejection of, of abortion and infanticide. And the final thing that I've identified out of what Rodney Stark found was that Christians were to love others, irrespective of their social class. Well, I want to pick up on this last one because it seems to me, having been involved in, in humanitarian work for many years, that it's this last one that maybe more than any other reason caused so many people in the Roman Empire to become believers. It was this. In Rome of that era, there were a lot of plagues. And the people didn't live like we, we see the palaces of Pompeii. They lived in squalid slums together with very little ventilation, no indoor running water. Sanitation was very poor. And when disease got started in a community, it often spread from one community to the other with lightning speed. And so if a disease like cholera would come around, if you got sick, there was a 60, 70% chance that you weren't gonna make it. Well, I wanna show you in a series of slides what Rodney Stark shows. Look at this slide. Here we have one Christian and there are four non-Christians who are friends. And they all care about each other. And a plague comes to this community. Well, the guy on the right happens to be a doctor, and he knows how dangerous this plague is, and so what does he do? <laughs> he splits. So now there's a ratio of one Christian to three non-Christians. The plague comes, comes in force. And all four of these guys get pretty sick. Well, the non-Christians, parents or families, are afraid to care for them and afraid to be close proximity to them because they'll catch cholera and they'll die. So what do they do with these people, these three friends? They take them out and put them on the street so they can die out there. But the Christian's family takes their family member into the home Hydra keeps them hydrated, covered with a blanket. And then this non-Christian, this Christian friend of the other three remaining non-Christian says, guys, three of my friends, they're out on the street. Is there any way you could get them and bring them into the house? And that's exactly what the Christian families did. They brought those three guys with cholera into the house kept them hydrated. Unfortunately, even with the care, two died. But one of the non-Christians' friends survived. Now, what's the ratio? It's not one to one. It's, it's two Christians. And why? Because that non-believing person who was taken in by the family of a Christian survived because someone took care of him. So what do you think happens to him? He makes a pretty simple deduction. Wow, I survived because Christians cared. And Stark says this happened again and again and again throughout the 300 years of the post-Jesus era. And that kind of holistic service, it wasn't done so that those people were, they didn't ask them on the street, well, if we take you in, will you become a believer? Muslims do that. And fortunately, sometimes Christians have done that. But no, that wasn't the early church. At risk to their own selves, they took in people who could infect them and who could die. 
who could cause them to die. And Stark says it was this kind of the demonstration of sublimated love, sublimated self-interest. I'm not going to do what's best for me. I'm going to do what's best for you. Why? Because that is what Jesus did for me. Well, that's ancient history. What about today? I'll tell you a story, and I'll do it quickly. This is a story which is really a parable that came out of our early ministry, and it's based on reality. But one night I was meeting with a group of pastors in Central America who were very discouraged. They were slum pastors. And, um, and I don't know what happened, but it just seemed like the Spirit of God took over. And I began to share this story with them. And I did, honestly, I didn't know where it was going, but what happened was God brought it to a place that was very significant. This is a story. There's a place in this Central American city called Las Pavas, the Turkey, and is built on the side of a hill because all of the flat ground was already taken. So the, the campesinos, farmers who wanted to migrate to the city, this was the only place they could go. And they found an unclaimed piece of property on a steep hill and they built a shack and a hut. And this community called Las Pavas began to be quite large. No sanitation, no schools, no electricity, but just shacks where people could live. And this young pastor by the name of Juan, just out of Bible school, he felt God calling him to go move with his wife and his two little girls up to Las Pavas and to live there. And so he did. And he labored. He was bivocational. He worked during the daytime and he, um, and he pastored in the evenings and on weekends. He went door to door witnessing and he held a few Bible studies, finally got a Bible study to come to his house. But very little results. There were women, children, no men. And as it was his habit, early in the morning, Juan woke up, he was discouraged. Before he went to work, he sat at his table. He lit the carnation milk can that had a wick in it and um, it had paraffin in the can so that he could have light. And he, he was reading and he was reading in his Bible. And in this particular morning, he was reading from Isaiah 58. And, and as he was reading, he was, he was struck by the fact that God cared about the poor. The very people that he was ministering to, that he felt God had called him to minister to. And he cried out to God, he said, Father, I've been here for six months and I don't see any results. I have a few women and children coming to a Bible study once a week, no men, and nothing seems to be happening. No improvements are being made. While he was crying out to God, still dark outside, he heard a knock on the door. He said, who is it? And the voice said, it's Jesus one. Who? It's Jesus. No, no. Who are you really? I'm Jesus. I heard your prayer and I've come for you to show me what breaks your heart in this community. So he didn't believe it was Jesus. So he went to the door like you wouldn't either. And he lifted the bar on the door and because it was dark outside, he couldn't really see who was there, but it was a shape that seemed fairly safe. And he said, if you're really Jesus, come in. And Jesus said, no one. 
I want you to take me through the community to the places that break your heart. And he said, okay, but follow me. It's, been, it's the rainy season and I know where to go. So Jesus said, okay, I'll follow you. And they began to walk through the community. And one pointed at that house, he said, Lord, that is so sad. There's a woman there with several children and the only way she can feed her children is to be a prostitute in the house while the kids are there. Walked a little further. Because they were on the side of the hill, he would point up and down and see that house down there. Lord, sometimes at night there are screams coming from the, women, the wife and the children from the guy that comes home, he's an alcoholic, and he starts beating and screaming his wife and his kids. And I, I want so bad to go down there and try to rescue them, but I, I know I can't. You see that house over there? That's where the president of the Patronato lives. He keeps promising to go to the government and give get them to give us electricity and a clinic and a place like that where we can we can begin to have some services so he collects money from everybody but he uses the money on alcohol and women and one said jesus we're going to pass through the garbage dump so please hold your nose and as they walked by, rats were running and scurrying in and out of the garbage. And at this point, Juan heard somebody crying. He looked. It was Jesus. It was Jesus that was crying. And he saw that what broke his heart broke the heart of Jesus. And all of a sudden, Juan found himself up in the sky with Jesus, Jesus' arm around him. And Jesus said to Juan, Juan, I want to show you what my intentions are for your community. And so Jesus started talking about housing. And the shacks turned into not fancy houses, but adequate houses. Jesus talked about running water. And there wasn't running water in every house, but there were stands all through the community of potable water. Jesus talked about beauty. And you know what? That garbage pile disappeared and around that space there were trees and flowers and children playing ball in the middle of that place where garbage used to be. Jesus talked about sanitation and there were common latrines placed around the community. And Juan looked at that and he was thinking, man, I'd like to live in a place like that. And Jesus said, Juan, that's my intention for Las Pavas. And Juan said, I know Jesus, but I've been here representing you for six months and none of that has happened. He said, I can do that. Yeah, Jesus, I know you can do anything, but Juan, here's what I want you to do. At your next Bible study, I want you to ask each of the women, about 12 of them, to each save a handful of rice every day and put it in a separate container. Take a spoon of sugar every day and put it in a second container. Every week when the women do washing, you cut off an end of the soap bar. And then all 12 of them would come on Sunday and bring what they have, and you'll put it all together into one basket. And then I want you to take it. No, not you, but I want, <coughs> I want you to tell the women to take that basket of rice and sugar and soap to one woman in the community who doesn't know me and tell them it's from me. And he said, oh, Lord, you know, that's, that's a nice idea, but you know, that's not gonna bring those kinds of changes. One, yes, who am I? 
Well, you're Jesus. Juan, do you remember that I'm the one that multiplied five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 children, 5,000 men plus women and children? Yeah, I know, Lord, but one, who am I? Well, you're Jesus. Juan, do you remember that I'm the one who divided the Red Sea so that all of Israel could pass over? Do you remember that I'm the one that caused, that told Moses to strike the rock and provide a water for a whole community? Do you remember? Ah, oh, Jesus, I know. Juan, I'm the same one as you read about in the Bible. And I will begin to do those things. I will bring transformation to Las Pavas as my people in Las Pavas begin to sacrificially love their neighbors. One heard the rooster crow. And he looked around. He, he was sitting at his desk. The, the little can had gone out of paraffin and there was no more light, but the sun was coming up and he heard his wife and his children coughing behind the sheet that separated the one room of the little shack that they were living in. And he looked around. Where's Jesus? He wasn't there. W was that a vision? Was that a dream? Juan didn't know, but he knew that he'd been met by Jesus. And he had a whole new understanding of what it meant to be a pastor. It was to equip his people to serve. As we conclude, I'd like to ask you to look at some verses that are really important. The first is Colossians 1.20, and we've already referred to it, but it's so important, I want us to read it. Colossians 1.20. And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the purpose of God. The purpose of God is that his reconciliation for everything that was broken in the fall will not only be known, but will take place. That is God's plan, which will, in fact, be fulfilled. Now, turn backwards. Go to Ephesians 3.10. And with this, we'll conclude. Paul says in verse 9, I'm going to show you what the administration of this plan of God's is. This plan to reconcile everything that was broken in the fall. What is the administration of that plan? And Paul says this, His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the observing rulers and authorities in heavenly places. What does that mean? What it means is that God has chosen his church as the vehicle through which to demonstrate the reconciliation and restoration. Jesus accomplished the reconciliation on the cross. The restoration is something that began immediately following the cross and will continue until Jesus returns. But the instrumentality for that is the church, not a building, not your local church, but the people in the church, the people who name Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the strategy. The goal isn't to win everybody to Christ. The goal is to demonstrate God's people to demonstrate his plan of restoration. And who 
the church. How are they going to do it? Through sacrificial, intentional love. So I have a proposition for you. And this is the proposition. God's principal purpose for the church is to display his plan of reconciliation. Second proposition, God's principal strategy for the church is to disciple its people to be servants who display his agenda as servants in all domains, not just in the domain of evangelism or spiritual issues, but in all domains. Talk about that. 